This week we are going to read from the Prince today and talk about the contents, the approach followed by Machiavelli, what we can extrapolate from these chapters. Keep in mind that our focus is not strictly historical. So we're not going to analyze in depth the historical details. We're not going to go through a large examination of the larger background or the examples. We're trying to go from these pages to some kind of matrix that we can then apply to texts or films, TV series that profess to be Machiavellian or that appear to be so. On Wednesday, our Machiavellian text will be a new one, will be Princessa Machiavelli for Women, one of several books that offer a female point of view on Machiavelli and trying to apply that to the gender wars, to the power dynamics in relationships. On Friday, our film will be, once again, for the second and last time, The Godfather, part one. We will watch another 20, 25 minutes and see what happens to Michael Corleone, the model citizen of the Corleone Mafia family and how necessity makes him into a Machiavellian leader of his own Machia family and, and a less than honest man. And then the entire trilogy will be, in one way, you can see it as the story of Michael's failed attempt to return to an honest life, to enjoy the tranquility of his family to embrace the family values and the social values he appears to admire, and yet, of course, he will never be able to, right? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. This is what the older version of Michael Al Pacino will say in the last film of the trilogy. Okay. Um, announcements. I still have 10 or 12 assignments to correct from the first written assignment on the uh, assessment of the Machiavellian nature of a specific con from the list that was posted inside a specific page evaluating Machiavellian games. I reviewed and added comments to the pages, the notes, you wrote about the film last Friday. They're on that table. So uh, I may circulate them. And, and if you were here on Saturday and you want to see what I wrote, get yours. Um, and you have another, a second assignment that is listed in the class website. It's about Robert Greene. Keep in mind that you can pick between two different approaches for that assignment. You can once again focus on a specific historic example of some kind of deceit, manipulation, some kind of Machiavellian game. And many are included in the excerpts from Robert Greene. If by any chance you've read the book, you have the book, you can also pick from another chapter that is not in those excerpts. So in that case, you would summarize the episode, the example provided by Robert Greene. Then you would apply to that example the same kind of schema, the same matrix, the same terminology and ideas. Do we find direct use of power and force? Do we find indirect use of the forms of control? Do we find influence? Do we find force? 
Do we find deterrence? Do we find authority? Do we find manipulation? Is the Machiavellian strategy repeatable? Is the outcome predictable? Is there an element of necessity? And so on and so forth. So you just extended the work that was required for the first assignment to a slightly different category of examples. However, as I said, you have an alternative approach following what I did last Wednesday, which was to talk about the themes and the general ideology of Robert Greene's book. You can also sample different paragraphs, different passages throughout the excerpt, excerpts from the 48 Laws of Power without ever talking about a specific example and talk about some of the recurring themes in Robert Greene's book and how much or how little those themes can be seen as Machiavellian, okay? So it's up to you to decide what works best for you also, how your, your general mindset would like, uh, how much would like one approach or the other. And as usual, um, uh, you can come to me for, for assistance. And if you need more time, because you need to work out how this kind of analysis can be done, let me know. Before we finally read from chapter three of The Prince, I want to review with you at some concepts and uh, examine some new concepts that we will find at work in chapters three and then the following chapters as well. First of all, from the very beginning, even in chapters one and two, there were some hints to that, even more in chapter three, and once again, we'll find this concept in chapter seven, eventually, when we get there, which is one, chapter seven is one of the pillars, one of the foundational sections of the prince where Machiavelli will say, here is the most perfect example of a Machiavellian prince, Cesare Borgia, and by the end of the chapter, he will destroy his own example by saying he was a terrible loser, he failed miserably, okay? And we'll try to understand this contradiction. But there is a constant emphasis on the idea of a new state. However, oftentimes is not an entirely new state. That will not be the case for chapter three. That will not be the case for chapter seven, where we find the most egregious example of Machiavellian leadership. It's always a partially new state. Why this emphasis? Keep in mind the historical introduction when I drew a map of Italy, and I talked about the extreme degree of political fragmentation and the competition between local authority and overseen authorities in some areas, right? The church having some kind of authority in central Italy, but then the local city-states being largely independent. I emphasize how most of those small or regional states in Italy during the time of Machiavelli were competing for the same economic interests. In most cases, commerce, and commerce that had to do with the Mediterranean and importing goods from Northern Africa and more importantly from the Middle East manufacturing products with those goods, exporting both manufactured and raw products, materials within Italy itself and outside of Italy into France, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, sometimes as far as England and Spain. So competition at different levels and yet this system had an intrinsic weakness. 
the weakness that led to the demise of the leadership that Italy enjoyed at the beginning of the so-called Renaissance, which wasn't just artistic, intellectual leadership, but it was also economic leadership. Italy was the most powerful economy. If you take all together, all of the various locales, the most powerful economy in Europe, and that funded the creation of art that you so much enjoy when you go to Italy these days. But Italy was not a national state. Contrary to what France, to the conditions, the political status that France, England, Spain uh, had reached and, and the empire in, in a very different way had, had tried to uh, do. So, when Machiavelli, as a man of his own time, who is active in politics, who works for the administration of a small city-state, but a powerful one, such as Florence, when Machiavelli looks at the situation and he examines the critical points, the factors that will either determine the resurrection of Italy and the Italian interests or the complete subordination of Italy to other foreign European countries, clearly the solution that is constantly on his mind is some kind of unification. Ideally, a complete national unification of Italy. That is to say, Machiavelli is thinking, and by the end of the book, he will come out with a, an emotional plea and he, this, this idea will be placed in the open. Ideally, the best solution to the political and military crisis, plural, ES, of Italy, would be to transform Italy into a new nation. And therefore, even when he's talking about politics in general and a variety of political scenarios, Machiavelli always has in mind, as a very pragmatic man, that he is not just talking about politics. He's talking about politics of his time, even when he's talking about the past, even when he's talking about the King of France or the Empire. What he has in mind is these are the recommendations. These are the suggestions that would make Italy more powerful, more importantly, powerful enough to withstand the invasions by France, the empire, and Spain. So ideally, Italy should be the new state that Machiavelli is talking about. If not the entire nation, at least northern and central Italy, which even at this time are, in many ways, the more powerful engines of the Italian economy. With the Kingdom of Naples being the largest territory from Naples to Sicily, and yet with an economy that dwarfs compared to the economies of places such as Florence, Venice, or even Ferrara, Milan, Genoa. It's not a new state, hence the single quotes. It's not a new state, this idea, this solution that Machiavelli has in mind would not consist of something that is entirely new because clearly unification would bring together different regions, different areas that have enjoyed some degree of independence at least from the 11th century, at least for the past three, four, or 500 years at this point. Not to mention that you might want to go back in time and review how even during the Roman Empire, even 
by the end of the Roman Republic, the complete unification of Italy, the complete, complete assimilation of the people, the various ethnic groups that lived in Italy at that time, was not completed. And when the empire began, began to falter, when the empire uh, failed to exercise a systematic, comprehensive control of the Italian uh, territories, these local identities, even at the linguistic level, came back, right? And one of the things you know, even superficially about Italy, even if you haven't studied Italy, even if you haven't gone to Italy, you know that there are a lot of regional dialects, you know that there are a lot of regional cuisines, right? And cuisine is the reflect, the, 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 the consequence of a different identity altogether. Why so? Because again, even under the Romans, there, were, there was the standard Latin, the high level Latin of the educated Roman citizens, but there were still previous languages, languages that populations that moved nomadically into Italy had been used had been using and went back to using more and more when the Roman Empire was there, but it was a distant form of authority. It was present in Rome, then it was present in Constantinople, but the empire was more concerned with the borders of Eastern and Central Europe, with the invasions of the barbaric populations than with assessing its presence and unifying the culture of the uh, areas at the margins, the areas that were not important politically or economically. So Italy was never one, not even when the Romans assigned Italy first to one administrative area, then to two, north and south. All the more reasons to appreciate what, how this situation was affected by centuries of medieval political fragmentation when you have each city-state or an area smaller than a single Italian region having their own constitution, their own laws, their own language, even their own measures. I was talking to a student uh, to Nigel last week about the fact that well into the 19th century before Italian unification began in 1861 someone such as a simple merchant doing business with other areas or traveling through Italy would need two things would need bilingual dictionaries and they were still being printed in the 1800s. So Venetian Florentine or Milanese Neapolitan. Because they could understand each other, but not fully. There might be the need to look for a precise word. And the other thing they would need, some kind of manual, and again, they were still being printed in the 1800s, with the equivalences of the measure. And uh, in other classes, I've offered the example of a book printed by a former lieutenant in central Italy, a man by the name of Guidi. And inside Guidi's wonderful book from the 1830s, when you go and look at how long is a mile in Italy, you find three or four pages where for a hundred different locales, more or less, you see that a mile in Naples is this long, a mile in Milan is this long, etc., etc. And then, of course, it goes into the actual measures that are relevant for merchants. How long is a yard? If someone from Venice sends you an order in Rome for 100 yards of silk, how much do you, are you selling? How much are you sending back? How much are they expecting? Right? So you have to consult this table and say, okay, 
a yard in Rome is this long, but a yard in Venice is slightly shorter, and this is how much I have to send my customer. Same with the pound. How many grams in a pound in Rome, in Milan, in Florence, and every area, even towns that during the 1800s only numbered in the tens of thousands, not even the largest metropolitan areas, had their own system of measures. That's how fragmented Italian culture has always been. So when Machiavelli is talking about the need of a different approach, different strategies for a new state, and the fact that this new state will probably be not entirely new, what he has in mind, the big picture, the underlying message of this book, The Prince, is Italy can benefit from these ideas in order to turn into a new state and be powerful enough to withstand the intrusions of other European countries. The second thing you have to keep in mind is, and, and something that is never openly declared by Machiavelli, but always present in every page where they're talking about leadership and the competition or the opposition between the leader of a community, of a society, of a state, and the citizens, is this Renaissance-like idea of leadership inside humanity. And the idea is, is very, it's, it's a very brutal approach. Not everyone can be a leader. By nature, by birth, not just by social standing, but also by natural skills and qualities, only some individuals in every time and place. Time and place are important because leadership is also very much connected to uh, a place. And we'll see how this uh, generates uh, uh, very innovative statements and, and weird statements at that in chapter six given a space and a time within that context, limited by time and space, only some individuals are born to be leaders. Of those individuals that have received the skills that are required to be a leader in that context, again, there is no set of skills for every time and every situation, but even for those few individuals who were born during a time for the right set of skills to become a leader within that space or context, only those in this small group who will have developed and fully expressed their skills may become leaders. What about the rest of humanity? The rest of humanity is sheep. That's the view of Machiavelli, that most people are gregarious by nature. They may be good within their profession. So if you want to spend the word leader, you may call them leaders within their professional practice, right? You can be a great merchant, a great lawyer, a great notary, but when it comes to leadership, in reference to the directions that society should take, then you have a few heroes, because this is the notion that you find often mentioned in Renaissance culture. Only a few individuals can be heroes. The others are sheep. The others are gregarious by nature when it comes to the, the organization of society and, and social transactions in general, not business transactions or the transactions between a lawyer and a customer. There, a lawyer can be a leader in its own activity, right? But when it comes to it, to this lawyer's place in society, he will, in most instances, Machiavelli says, Machiavelli believes. You, you don't have to believe that at all, right? You just have to understand this will be gregarious, okay? So this is the idea, and it's reflected in all sorts of ways, right? 
uh, it's the idea that some individuals can make a difference for the whole of society. These are the few giants, and the rest is the mass. And the masses will follow the lead, whether they like it or not, either because they don't have the skills to become leaders, or they're not in any situation to resist the directions, the decisions selected by those who become leader, leaders. Then the leaders can be in competition with each other, right? It doesn't mean that necessarily there is one leader. It just means that a leader has to guard from the opposition of either the few opponents who are at the same level, and that's why Machiavelli will insist on physical elimination, because if you believe that you only have a few true competitors, then elimination is efficient as a way to play the political game, right? Because it's not something that becomes a genocide, right? It's just identifying those who might replace you as a leader and eliminating those few. Now, when it comes to the citizens, keep this in mind as well, because otherwise what Machiavelli will tell you might seem contradictory. That is to say that single individual citizens are never strong enough to mount a relevant, meaningful opposition to the leader, okay? So when it comes to single individuals or a small number of those individuals, the same reasoning I posited before can be applied. The same way that you can apply physical elimination to the few who are competing for leadership in your political context, in that same way, the leader, according to Machiavelli, always has the means to get rid of a few citizens take their properties, place those citizens in jail, or even eliminate those citizens. But only when it comes to a select few citizens. When it comes to the mass of the citizens, the population of the state, that is by itself a formidable adversary. Because the prince cannot eliminate all of them, or use force on the whole population, because according to Machiavelli, that would be a losing game. That would not be efficient. That would require resources that eventually you would run out of, because where do you get your resources to maintain your influence and use power, use force? You get them from society. If you apply force to the whole of society, then you paralyze the production means of society. Then you turn society altogether as something that is a system that is unproductive and resources cease to get to you. And therefore, without resources, you cannot pay for your soldiers, you cannot pay for your administrative agencies, etc., etc. So keep this in mind, even with this view, the leader is a giant, the rest of your mind is sheep, it doesn't mean that the power of the prince, the power of the leader applied to society doesn't have any boundaries. It doesn't have any boundaries when it comes to select individuals or select group. When it comes to society altogether, the prince has to be very careful and that's why Machiavelli will always recommend some kind of combination between influence and force, or influence and deterrence, because force has to be the extrema ratio, has to be the very last resort, because it is the most expensive, both in terms of material resources and also because it will affect your influence, it will affect your ability to maintain a positive image, give hope to the citizens so that the citizens will 
be confident in you as a paternal protective figure and continue to work, continue to invest their money, continue to grow society economically. So just a few leaders, a lot of people who are gregarious, but when it comes to the whole of the population, you cannot really touch it no matter how strong your leadership is. You have to deal with them in complex way because this whole, this totality, which is society, generates the resources if society is not productive because they're paralyzed by fear. They may be obedient, but they're not being productive, and therefore you run out of resources and your power decreases. Third concept that you will find over and over deployed by Machiavelli, but again, it's not ever spelled out by Machiavelli, something that you have to read into the examples or the various paragraphs. The idea that society is a system means the following, that society is a process or a series of processes interacting with each other, that every element, the single citizens, the groups, the means of production, the infrastructure, all of these elements are generating processes that affect each other. Which means that if you touch, if you change something, if you affect any part of society, the repercussions will go beyond the person, the infrastructure, the means of production that is being affected. The repercussions will be felt everywhere. That's why over and over again in chapter two, in chapter three, and uh, in future chapters as well, Machiavelli will insist that if you don't change anything, then it's easy to maintain power. But if you want to introduce new laws, new social practices, then you'll find the opposition of humanity, and they may not be a leader, but their opposition as a totality, as a group of all the citizens will be a strong opposition. Strong because you'll need too many resources if you cannot, if you don't have the authority sufficient so that the citizens will follow you, okay? So keep this in mind. The context is not static. The context in which leadership is deployed, in which pol the political games are played that are described by Machiavelli, the context is never static. It's always dynamic. Then dynamic means that all the elements in it, both human elements and material elements, infrastructure, means of production, are interacting with each other. You touch one element, the repercussions are felt throughout the system. If the system already has some kind of equilibrium, that's when you need to do very little. And you don't want to upset that homeostatic, homeostasis, an equilibrium that is the harmonious interactions, again, not static, but the harmonious interaction of the various elements in society. However, if you start change, you know that this change will have consequences, then you need to ride the wave of changes in a timely fashion, and you need to make sure that you go through the changes you need to apply to the system quickly enough that you restore some kind of equilibrium before it is too late, before a crisis hits the whole system. Keep in mind the idea of necessity, which is a constant theme in Machiavelli. Necessity can be seen in many ways. It's not from the top down, it's also from the bottom up. That is to say, even the leader who as seems to have, appears to have absolute power, is limited in their use of this power because there will be consequences and there will be costs. So even the prince doesn't have complete control of any situation. For example, there is an interesting reference, uh, uh, yeah, I believe it's in chapter three, to the leak of power that happens when you have a big force, when you have a big army. And this, of course, it's 
relatable for Machiavelli to what was going on during the 1500s with mercenary armies or even the national armies of the empire and, and France. When you deploy an army, then you cannot control the use of violence by every single member of that army. There will always be what I call a league. That is to say, you deploy thousands or tens of thousands of soldiers. Most of them will respect the rules of engagement, right? Will respect the rules, but others will take advantage of the situation, will abuse their power. It's unavoidable. Exactly because you have so many soldiers and there is no way you can control each one of them. So some of them will, in Machiavellian terms, offend the population. That is to say, Machiavelli over and over again will hint to this phenomenon, which was very common and something he himself was familiar with as a man of his time, that if you send an army, especially an army of mercenary, but any army into a territory, you cannot avoid that some of them will kill, steal, damage, do damage, and the officers or the generals or the leader, the political leader of the state that sent the army, they will not be able to, to control this in every single instance. Some of that will always happen, okay? So what is that you have to keep in mind? That this entire ideology by Machiavelli is based on a culture that is different from ours, radically different in that it embraces risk. It recognizes that risk is always there. That in Machiavellian terms, you can try to achieve as much control over the outcome as possible, but it will never be 100% or close to 100%. Why is that different? Because our own society and the societies of the past 60 years have been obsessed with the idea of maximizing efficiency, reaching 100%, right? If I have to sit in another workshop where they say, think of people working in a control tower, they need to land 100% of the planes, they cannot afford a single plane to go down. Well, I'm not working in a control tower. I'm not <laughs> dealing with planes. So I cannot give you 100% of students who will learn from my classes. There is no way. It's not how the learning process works, okay? So in order to achieve 100% in any given situation, whether it's teaching, policing, or anywhere else, in order to approach totality, you need some kind of totalitarian system. You need to push control to the limits where control and authority becomes by itself oppressive or abusive. This society, in Machiavellian terms, try to get as close as possible to the certainty of a result, but they were very well aware that even the most powerful leader may not be able to defend themselves from a crazy killer, from the member of a family who suffered from the consequences of leadership who will try to exact revenge. And Machiavelli had those examples in mind, right? Even the Medicis who were very powerful in Florence uh, suffered such an attempt, right? The famous Lorenzo the Magnificent and his brother were attacked one morning in a church. Uh, they were going to this religious ritual and the mem a member of the Pazzi family who had been eliminated in the political gleam of Florence by the Medici's attacked them with, with knives and uh, Lorenzo the Medici's brother was killed. Lorenzo was only wounded and he survived and, and recovered in terms of political leadership. But this, this idea that risk cannot be eliminated is very much in Machiavelli's time and Machiavelli's culture. Risk cannot be eliminated even now, but there is an obsessive focus on 
going from 90% to 100% or even from 99% to 100% in our society, in all areas of our society. The, this idea that risk has to be completely eliminated, okay? And you see the consequences in all kinds of ways, right? The excessive use of police force, of authority and force by the American police is very much, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, the result of this risk-averse culture, which is asymmetric because risk-averse means that when a police stops a car, what they have in mind is not a single cop should be killed by uh, the driver of a car that was stopped, which means that plenty of citizens will be killed as a result, right? Because that's the only way to eliminate that risk, to react even before you identify a gun really in the hands of the driver, right? Approaching every single uh, stop and search as the potential stop and search of the worst possible criminal instead of doing the opposite. What would be the risk embracing approach to that kind of police practice? That you treat every single driver as a senator, as a member of the president's cabinet with the utmost respect, knowing that there will be risks because some of those drivers might be criminals. But you reverse, you put the risk on the side of the policeman instead of on the side of the citizens. Because otherwise, those things will continue to happen. Okay, so let's examine chapter three, finally, okay? The difficulties are in the new principality. Again, once again, the insistence, the emphasis on new. And let me read from this to, I'll, I'll go through this, but I'll, I'll skip a few sentences here and there. And he calls your attention to the fact that they're not entirely new, they can be called mixed, because it's a mix of the old and the new. And this is what Machiavelli has in mind for Italy, right? If Florence becomes part of a regional um, state, including most of Northern Italy and some of Central Italy, or if Florence becomes part of a national Italian state, the old power structure, the old political practices are not completely erased. And that's how you get to the idea of a mix. There is a natural difficulty that exists in, new, in all principalities. And what Michelotti says a natural difference, difficulty means it's built into the system, right? And what is? That men willingly exchange their lord if they believe they will be better off. And this is one of the constant, it's a psychological constant for Machiavelli. The idea that this is the natural incl inclination of humanity, regardless of whether they're placed at the level of leadership or not. In fact, he's talking about humanity without leadership because if you follow the passage, later they will say, it, it will say that how will they try to be better off? What kind of change will they be able to support? They'll have to support a leader. So he's not talking about a popular revolution. There is no popular revolution for Machiavelli. There is anarchy. But the only way out of anarchy is the leadership of some, whether it be a single leader or an elite uh, of leaders. An elite mean, meaning the top echelon of society, the top 1%, the top 2%, insurance, good order, and stability in society. So there is this psychological, psychological constant to be better off. And to be better off is an echo, a reminiscence of the logic of capitalism. It's talking about growth. It's talking about doing better. It's talking about being more successful, successful in terms of wealth, in terms of uh, commerce, etc. right? But in order to achieve that, the people will have to select and support another leader. And then what will happen? There is another 
natural and ordinary necessity. So you may want to ensure a certain kind of outcome, but you will not be able to do it with any degree of certainty, according to Machiavelli. What is this necessity that affects leadership, right? Leadership is not complete freedom, no matter how much power you have. The leader is never free. What is the necessity? One always has to offend those of whom one becomes a new prince. In other words, a new prince cannot sustain themselves only out of their use of influence, but they have to use deterrence, and sometimes they'll have to deploy force as well. If not, there is always the issue of the leak in the use of force, that once you deploy soldiers, some of them will commit violence, acts of violence, justified or unjustified. It's, it's never, uh, the, the war situation is never a situation where you can control the use of violence, restrict the use of violence, right? Any way you look at this, right? You may not want to harm civilians, but if you throw hundreds of rockets, some of them will hit a condominium or a school, etc. So with soldiering, right? We're talking about the fact that the more soldiers you deploy and the more you have the chance of violence being uh, used and affecting the citizens, and with the other infinite injuries that come with the new acquisitions. So, meaning in order to solidify the state, you have to use force, and even if you stay away from applying force indiscriminately, you have soldiers, and some of those soldiers will use force indiscriminately, okay? The result is that you have as enemies all those that you have offended. So you apply force to the social constituency of your state, and of course the citizens will withdraw their support, right? Will turn into enemies. Um, and you cannot maintain as friends those who have put you there, so your supporters, well, since they're your supporters, you'll have to just use influence in that case. But what is the implication here is that influence is never sufficient. There is no situation in which by using influence alone, you can exercise a sufficient degree of control, which is the limit in terms of defining Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power Machiavellian or any modern book Machiavellian is that according to Machiavelli, if you really want to have control over a situation, unless you're talking about some kind of very small context, but once you expand that context, then you'll need also to have force on your side. Okay? And you can see Oh, this is interesting as well. You cannot satisfy them, your supporters, in that manner that they had earlier supposed, right? Think of any election, think of the presidential election. You vote for a candidate. Are you then usually satisfied with that candidate that you elected or dissatisfied within a year, two years, etc. right? That's usually the case because the promises you, you liked a candidate as a candidate, but you don't like that same candidate as a leader because they cannot deliver on the promises of their electoral campaign, if you consider the current example. And talking about influence, it says later, or you cannot use strong medicines against them, it's still the use of force. And this is the passage I wanted. Even though a prince is very strong when it comes to armies, he needs the favor of the provincials to enter into a province. Meaning, even when you have a lot of force, the same way that you cannot just use influence to have uh, enough control, 
you cannot use just force to reach that level of control or you can only within a very limited space and time you will also need local support you will also need influence right you can defeat another state army but unless you have some support from the totality of the citizens that you can get through influence then you can really sustain your occupation and again you see examples even now in the current events.